The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Please be seated. The first few Sundays of Easter, we've heard about the appearances of the risen Christ for our gospel lessons. However, last week's and today's gospels come from the heart of John's farewell discourses. They are a part of John's telling of the Last Supper, when Jesus is explaining to his disciples that he will be betrayed, tried, and killed, that he will be leaving them. Perhaps the lectionary has brought us back to these readings because this next Thursday, the 40th day of the great 50 days of Easter, we will recognize Jesus' ascension into heaven when Jesus will once again leave his disciples, or at least physically leave them. But while these readings come from before Christ's resurrection story, we hear Jesus' reassurance to his disciples in the light of our Easter experience, knowing that he rose again from the dead to be with them and with us. So his warnings of his departure and the coming of the Holy Spirit to guide the life of the church now resonate in our experience as we look toward Ascension Day on Thursday and the Feast of the Pentecost soon to come. In the Eucharistic service, there are several offertory sentences that the prayer book offers as uh, options that the presider could use. The one that I've always chosen to use is May the words of my mouth, no, that's not it. The one I've always chosen to use is walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. It comes from Ephesians 5 2. And perhaps you've noticed, as I have recently, that we're hearing that offertory sentence offered a little bit differently. Listen today when Reverend Dan offers, because he doesn't say walk in love as Christ loved. He says walk in love as Christ loves us 
and gives himself an offering and sacrifice to God. He keeps it in the present tense because Jesus' physical departure from us changes nothing. We can remain in him and he in us as he is the vine and we are the branches. And the fruit of the vine is the fruit of love, which is one of the key themes in both the farewell discourse and in John's gospel as a whole. I was at a church once whose rector ended the service with these words. Our service has ended, but our work has just begun. When you leave here today, remember to clothe the poor, to feed the hungry, and to love those who have no one else but you to love them. Everything about that statement moves me, but I was particularly struck by the last part. Remember to love those who have no one else but you to love them. We hear stories in the news about people who struggle to find clothes and food, but how often do we think about those who are unloved? Actually, if we listen to the news carefully, we would hear those stories as well. It may not occur to us, however, that it is not only within our power to do something about this, it is also one of the things we are called by Christ to do. We heard last week in the text from 1 John that we love because God first loved us. And the commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. And this week we hear from 1 John in the verses immediately following those, Everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God. It sounds a little bit like a circular argument. Loving God means loving God's children, and loving God's children means loving God. But it's not meant to be one or the other, rather both and. Meaningful relationships are, not only, are on, not only found wherever the love of God abides, but they also reveal our love of God. God is present in and through all of our relationships. Loving God includes loving God's children, and loving God's children includes loving God. One of the authors I read this week said this, as beautiful as love may be, we too often throw the word around lightly. We are called to greater word care. Theologians, that would be all of us, theologians are people who watch their language in the presence of God. And I love the way that John offers the commandment this week. We so often hear, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, which doesn't always seem like that high of a standard. There have been times in my life in which I haven't really loved myself that much. I would like to think that God would ask me to love my neighbor more than myself. Or even when I am loving myself, shouldn't I be loving my neighbor more? And that's what I love about John. He doesn't say, love thy neighbor as thyself. He says, love one another as I have loved you. So the example of how I am to offer love to you isn't based on whether I offer love to myself. It's based on the fact that God loves me. And as much as God loves me, that is how I am to love others. So we've been hearing about Jesus' love and his commandment for us to love a lot during Easter. And when I told Amy what the gospel passage was, she said, well, that'll be easy. That's all you talk about is love. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but I just preached two weeks ago about love. And then Dan preached more about it last week. And she said, well, I guess Jesus has more to say about it. <laughs> And then she said, I hope you do too. <laughs> so 
So I looked harder at the parts of the gospel text that I know that I've never preached on. In John, verses 13, John 15, verses 13 through 15, we hear, No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. I think I've shied away from these lines before because I've never really been sure how I feel about being Jesus's friend. I've always been quite comfortable with Jesus being the son of God, the Messiah, my strength, and my redeemer. But my friend, it sounds like that warning that they give parents of teenagers, don't try to be their friend. <laughs> You're their parents. How can Jesus be my savior and my friend? It seems like a lot to ask of a friend for both of us. Fortunately, one of the authors that I read said, Christians are often so busy being God's servants, working for Jesus, that we forget he wants us to be his friends, to love him and be loved by him. According to Aristotle, one of the best ways to habituate oneself in a particular virtue is to emulate those who already embody it. This is most likely to be successful when we become, have become friends with those whose lives we seek to emulate. For a friend, says Aristotle, is another self. Friends form each other in the moral life, taking on each other's characteristics, both good and bad. We are known by the company we keep. In fact, we are very likely to become the company we keep. Aristotle goes on to describe three kinds of friendships. We become friends with some people because it is useful. They allow us to make business connections or to get into a particular social group. Other friendships are pleasurable. We cultivate these because we enjoy them. But the third kind of friendship, the best kind, according to Aristotle, is for the sake of the friendship itself. These friendships take more time, more effort, more of ourselves. These are the people we can really be ourselves with. We don't have to keep part of ourselves at arm's length or hide the parts we don't like. These friendships are the most formative. A true friend who loves as God loves will in time teach us how to love as God loves. So when Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you, he is not offering a useful or pleasurable friendship. He's describing the kind of friendship that Aristotle calls the best kind. We are called into this kind of relationship with Jesus and thereby with God. Thomas Aquinas offered a Christian response to Aristotle's discussion of friendship suggesting that part of the goal of the Christian life was to become friends with God. Through this friendship, we hope to take on God's characteristics as our own and to love one another as God loves us. In today's reading from the Acts of the Apostles, the people were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit was given even to the Gentiles. God's love really does apply to all God's children, whether we want it to or not. Fortunately, it's not up to us. We as humans are limited in our ability to love unconditionally. 
We have a need to separate people into groups. We want to be included in the right groups. And we have a tendency to include others who we feel are worthy or exclude those we deem unworthy. When in your life have you experienced what it is like to be a Gentile, to be considered other or unworthy, to be excluded based on a cultural norm and not on who you are as a child of God? What about the places in our lives where we have done the excluding? Whether it's a reaction to our own treatment as other, or whether it's a completely different situation. When we do the excluding, we are not living into God's commandment. In the right one service, the service that we do at the 745, it's a more traditional language, After the end of the confession and the absolution, there are four quotations from scripture that the priest may choose from. One of them is also from John's first letter. It says, if anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sin, and not for ours alone, but for the sins of the whole world. Again, we hear that it is not just a specific group of people that are saved through Christ's sacrifice. It's the whole world. In Jesus' time, you would not find rabbis looking for disciples. It was the other way around. Disciples who were seeking a rabbi would go and listen to them teach and choose the one who they wanted to learn from. But not Jesus. Jesus reminds his disciples and us. He chooses us. It's not us that choose Jesus. We are chosen. And we're chosen for a purpose so that we can go and bear fruit. And the fruit of the vine is the fruit of love. And our final verse in today's gospel, Jesus repeats his final commandment, love one another. Whether it be at your place of work or play, here at St. Barnabas or in the larger church, here in Scottsdale, or elsewhere in Arizona, or the nation, or the world, we are reminded that we are all children of God. We are all loved by God and called by God to love one another. Truly, our work has just begun. When you leave here today, remember to clothe the poor to feed the hungry, and to love those who have no one else but you to love them. And walk in love as Christ loves us and offers himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.